Well, I want to thank the staff and everybody that put up the lights this morning for my presentation. I thought that was just off and awesome as I drove in here. I'm like, man, they didn't have to go to all this work. So we're going to talk about the four pillars. Actually, this concept has been around for a long, long time. It used to be called the four legs of the stool. Okay? We're not talking about four laws, not in the Bible. These are the four laws. We're talking about four pillars. We're talking about four pillars that will help us to be better stewards of our money. So before I do that, I want to tell you just a bit about myself so you know where I'm coming from. I've spent my whole life in the financial industry. Start the two minutes over there, guys. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> And uh, so I grew up in a very dysfunctional household. And, but I had a sister who was 16 years older. She would come and take me to Sunday school every Sunday. She would try to sit down and teach me scripture. Worked very well until I got into junior high school. <clears throat> and then I thought, I've got better things to do than this. I can practice my sports, I can study for my exams. I've got to be the best in everything so I can get myself out of this place. So my entire focus <clears throat> set in on being number one at whatever I did. Got a master's degree, of course a bachelor's degree, passed the CPA exam, passed a number of other professional exams, and <clears throat> I went to work for a very large CPA firm. After four years, I became partner. I was like, wow, four years, unheard of. Six years later, I left, started my own firm, built it to a very, very large CPA firm. During <clears throat> that growth period, I started a wealth advisory firm, grew that to a very, very large wealth advisory firm. And then I began climbing the ranks of <clears throat> the profession, became the head of one of the world's largest accounting organizations spoke all over the world that's how I got to the timekeeper thing I always had a timekeeper I took with me <clears throat> so then you know after all this striving it just didn't seem to be satisfying and then cancer hit me <clears throat> the stage of the cancer the location of the cancer and <clears throat> um, the type of cancer I had um, you know, I can, uh, I read a lot of stuff, and uh, so I'm smart enough to go and read the medical journals and figure out what this is. I had a 5% chance of living three years. Now, that was a wake-up call. That's when you start going, wait a minute, where am I? Where do I want to be? What legacy am I leaving? What's my relationship to God? What's my significance in this world? So if I don't get back to it, the bottom of this, these four pillars, the driving thing, the thing that causes the four legs to get out of balance is our struggle for and our desire to achieve significance as men. That's the root of a lot of problems. That's how the stool gets out of balance. That's Christmas season, and we just heard a very nice uh, presentation by Scott. I walked into Starbucks. No secret that I'm a coffee addict. Have to have my Starbucks. I don't think you've ever seen me here without a cup, cup of coffee, right? And the barista says to me, I hate this time of year. Why? because it's all about money, it's all about presents, it's all about celebrating. I said, I think you're missing the point. She said, what? I said, it's not all about any of that. It's all about the birth of Jesus. So The Wolf of Wall Street. Now, how many guys saw that film? Okay. So we're gonna talk about the four pillars. The four pillars are save a little, little save a, <laughs> earn a little at a time, and save a little at a time. 
We're going to talk about how do we share our money. And then we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about uh, debt. Okay? Because they all have to go together. And <clears throat> the Wolf of Wall Street kind of starts us out. And if you put these things together, oops, I, did I advance that? Let me view. Okay. If you put them together, I think saving a little at a time and earning a little at a time go together, don't you? Because to save, you have to do it a little at a time and you have to do it in coordination with your income. Sharing, by the way, I could throw that in the same bucket. You should be doing that a little at a time as well. But Wolf of Wall Street was culturally po uh, popular. Why? It was culturally popular because we all like the get rich, fast strike life. It's exciting to us. I can tell you as a financial professional, does it happen very often? No, really doesn't. And if it does, are there issues or problems at the source of it? Well, that's what this movie was all about, right? Fraud and corruption. He lived a very exciting, fast life, and that's glamorous when we look at TV shows and movies, etc. But what's at the bottom of it? What's at the base of it? The biblical principle, if we can go there, the biblical principle is uh, Proverbs 13.11. He who gathers money little by little makes it grow. It didn't say get rich quick. It said he who gathers money little by little will make it grow. It put those two things together. In contrast, there's an entrepreneurial code. Did you know that? Entrepreneurial code is a dollar, a dollar borrowed is a dollar earned, a dollar refinanced is a dollar saved, and a dollar paid back is gone forever. Think about that for a minute. A lot of people that I see want to start businesses that are highly leveraged. You know how many of those survive? About 50%. And we'll get into debt in a minute. You see, today's culture is the fast lane, the quick money. Just turn on the TV and watch it. Andy talked about it in the first chapter. The rat race, he called it. But the quick money is the way to go. And that's when corruption happens. Doc Gallagher. <clears throat> Doc Gallagher had G Gallagher Financial Group. He actually uh, published a book called Jesus Christ Money Master. It's very good. Very, very good book. Okay? He also broadcast on Christian radio. His tagline was, I'll see you in church on Sunday. Okay, Doc Gallagher is 80 years old. He's, he's uh, serving three consecutive life sentences for bilking his clients out of $32 million. So the biblical story is he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. There's another movie that we want <clears throat> to just talk about for just a second. Pursuit of Happiness. How many people saw Pursuit of Happiness? Great movie. Great movie. It's a true story. It's based on uh, uh, the life of Christopher Gardner. He uh, invested his life savings in a bone density scanner. He was going to sell this thing. He was going to get rich quick. And everything was going to be beautiful. Okay, it didn't sell quick. So he took on, he thought, I can be a stockbroker. I can sell really well. I'll do that until this bone density thing goes wild. Problem is, you have to be a, you have to be a, a, uh, um, a student, a trainee for six months. So he wasn't making any income while he's going through that training process. Then the problem was that his wife left him with this little boy, Jordan. And then the problem was he lost his lease. So he's homeless, he's got a little boy, he's got a dream, 
And little by little, he pulled himself out of that. And during that time, he nurtured his son. He, he housed his son. He loved his son. If you haven't seen it lately, go watch it again. Because this is what, if you want to see a movie about what makes a man, in my opinion, this is the one. So let's throw out a, a financial planning rule of thumb. This is what I tell clients. Save 10%, share 10%, and then live off the rest. Okay, let's move to uh, the second stool, saving little by little. <clears throat> Scripture says, Scripture says, he who store up choice food and olive oil <clears throat> is wise, but fools gulp theirs down. Remember that when that was written, olive oil and choice food, that was, was riches, right? So how, how does this apply to this day? How does this apply to today? How many times do you see people that spend every dime they can, I can tell you being in this business, I see it all the time. Every dime that they make, plus some. Goodbye. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> so, that move takes us, of course, to, oops. Oh, there's, how'd that happen? Okay, another movie, of course. Money Pit. How many of you guys have seen Money Pit? Okay, that's interesting. <clears throat> More than all of the other movies we've had on here so far, but that's interesting. So Money Pit, Tom Hanks, and his, he's a New York lawyer. He's striving for the top, trying to get into the partnership. He has a girlfriend. They buy a dream home. She's a violin player, I think. Is that right? Anyway, she, I think she's a violin player. They stretch themselves to the limit. They buy this beautiful house, and they move in. And like the first day, the beautiful clawfoot tub from the th third floor, I believe it is, falls all the way down to the first floor. And then it just falls apart. And they have nothing left to pay for those emergencies. So, there's a statement that contentment will be a stranger in a house that saves no resources. That's the problem here. And I see that so often. So, one should follow what I call the 2836 rule. No more than 28% should go into your housing. That's total housing, that's mortgage, that's interest, that's uh, real estate taxes. And then 36%, no more than 36% of your household income should be in debt, including the mortgage, the car loans, the credit cards. Because what happens if you don't? If you don't, you're not going to end up with enough money at retirement to live. And so the author suggests the nest egg approach is, is best. <clears throat> now, the nest egg approach is figure out how much you need at retirement and then work it backwards. How much am I going to earn on my investments? How many years do I have to save to get there? And this is how much I have to put aside each, month, each year and then each month. <clears throat> I do it with business owners, small business owners. What do you need to retire on? This is what your company's worth now, and this is what it's going to need to be worth five years, ten years from now, in order for you to have to sell your company for X and have enough money to live on for the rest of your life. The nest egg approach. The biblical values of life are quietness, diligence, industry, prudence, patience. In other words, a little by little. It, it doesn't say 
quick strike there. It doesn't say fast. It says little by little. Those are the biblical values. So there are three guidelines. Give a portion of every dollar. Do your giving in secret. Against the temptation to be known, for people to know, and, and for you to be proud. And then give your gift as an offering to God, but not to man. Does it have to be all to the church? No. It doesn't have to all be to the church, but it, it should be for God's work, even if it's not church-affiliated. It should, should be for the body of Christ, my opinion. <clears throat> Okay, so that takes us to another biblical truth. For where <clears throat> your treasure is, there your heart is also. Okay, next to last movie. A Wonderful Life. Who's seen A Wonderful Life? How many times? No, I'm just kidding. It's that time of year, right? When that movie came out, it went bankrupt but it is most watched movie of all time why because i believe it has a biblical truth underlying it it's a, based on a book called the greatest gift james stewart as george bailey he gives up his personal dreams to help others in his community okay and he becomes depressed because it's not going well, is it? And on Christmas Eve, he thinks about taking his own life. And when he thinks about that, his guardian angel shows up and says, wait a minute. Let's take a look at your life. Let's take a look at what it would have been like for everyone else if you hadn't been here. Let's take a look at what would have happened to Mary, your wife. Let's take a look at what would have happened to this community. Wouldn't it be nice to have that kind of insight? But I got to ask you, in today's culture, in today's culture, do you think that people think like that anymore? I'm going to give up my dreams to go back and do what I think is right. I don't, I, I got to be honest with you, I don't see it that often with all of the people that I deal with financially and have dealt with financially for decades so um is this i don't know oh yeah so this is goes right along with that what did jesus think of tithing what did he truly think of tithing? He said to the Pharisees, you are hypocrites. Was that a 10 or a 15? That's a 15. <whistles> I better hurry. <clears throat> okay. He said to the, uh, the, the Pharisees, you are hypocrites. You're careful to tithe even the tiniest income, but you ignore the most important aspects of the law justice mercy and faith so guess what brings us to another movie how many people have seen this none shocking I would recommend it this, this movie is, about, is starring Michael B. Jordan. You know, I'm amazed at this intern pastor that we have. He had a sneaker contract at the age of six, and he was starring in movies, and nobody knew it. <clears throat> I mean, he'll probably take credit for this next time he speaks, right? Yeah, I was in that movie. No, it, this movie was about a young Harvard-educated lawyer in the movie, his name was Brian Stevenson. And it's a story of Walter McMillan. 
who, with the help of Brian, appealed his murder conviction. At the base of this, at the base of this is Micah 6.8. How many people are familiar with Micah 6.8? Micah 6.8. It's on the wall out there, painted on the wall outside. Micah 6, 8, do what is right, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's what it's about, right? Not the money. Help those that are persecuted and let God do the justice. God blesses us for giving not only our money, but our time and our hearts. Brings us to the last pillar. Everybody say, yay! Ted, you're about done. <clears throat> so, before I get to that slide right there, why do men go into debt? The fourth pillar is debt. Why do men go into debt? Consumerism is the idea that progressively greater consumption of goods is somehow beneficial to us. If you don't believe that, watch TV for an hour. It depends on constant uh, stimulation of our desire to buy things. I mean, obviously, you can buy your wife Chanel number no. five. She'll be dressed in a gown, you'll be in a tuxedo, and you'll be floating in the air and dancing. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? You know, this is a time of the year, year for spending, and, and my wife, I love her, uh, I love her dearly, and, but she loves to shop, right? And so her credit card got compromised about two months ago, and I haven't reported it yet, because the thief spends less money than she does. But that is a, a symptom of a consumptive lifestyle. It lets us pretend that we're something that we're not. You see it all the time. And today, in this culture, possessions are a measure of a man rather than his skills, rather than his contribution to society. And that leads men, I believe, into debt. I see it all the time. I see men come into my office in their 50s. What am I going to do, Ted? I've spent all my life working for this company, whether I own it or I just work in it. I spent every dime living this lifestyle. I'm 50 years old. This is how much I need to retire. How am I going to get there? truth of the matter is you're not truth of the matter is you can't earn 26.7 percent truth of the matter is that debt is a big reason that you're here you have been living this lifestyle that our culture says is glamorous War of the Roses. How many guys have seen that movie? Charmer, isn't it? War of the Roses. Okay, so Michael Douglas, Kathleen Turner, uh, he went into law. She went into housekeeping. They're both great at it. He made a lot of money. She spent a lot of money. Trying to live the image of having everything that is the best of the best. Okay, that's pretty funny, guys. <laughs> I'm almost there. Don't worry. No worries. So, uh, yeah, it's sort of the thing my wife said to me the other day. I need a new checking account. I said, why? What's wrong with the one you, that you have? And she said, it doesn't have any money left in it. <clears throat> She didn't really say that. I made that up. But they were, they were doing what is popular. 
what I see culturally happening, what is sort of a sickness. So what's the bottom line for all of this? So I'm a little behind, <clears throat> that bell was supposed to be the bottom line, but what's the bottom line up, up for all of this? The bottom line is, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. I thought I was managing my companies. I wasn't in that pilot seat. I shouldn't have been in that pilot seat. I thought I was in that pilot seat. Who should have been in that pilot seat? Jesus. When he got in the pilot seat, everything became a lot better. So be a good steward of your money. There's nothing wrong with earning a little at a time. There's a new book on the market written by a young uh, black lady, just lovely person I've seen her interviewed. And she, grew, she was raised by her grandmother. Her mother and father were both in prison. Her grandmother adopted her and her four siblings and raised them. They all went to college. <clears throat> the grandma paid off her house, working three jobs and supporting those kids. And grandma taught them something that is priceless. Grandma said, it doesn't matter what you do. You can be president of the United States if you want to. Eh, maybe not. <clears throat> you can be president or CEO of Apple Computer if you want to. You can be a school teacher if you want to. Pick something that will make you happy every day. And then stay in your lane. Don't try to pretend you're somebody else. That gets the stool out of balance. Priceless advice. So let's be a good steward with what we've been given. We've all been given our own gifts. Doesn't matter what we do. We just need to do it well. We need to be happy doing it. <clears throat> it is biblical to earn a little by little, not a quick strike. Save little by little. Share it with others. And then watch your debt. So, <clears throat> I think I better end it at that because my guys are going like this at this point. That's, those are my timekeepers over there. When I spoke nationally and internationally, I had a timekeeper. Her name was Louise. And <clears throat> Louise would give me these like these guys have been doing, you know. And then she went to a little clock like this. Well, I couldn't see the clock. So then she went to a timer that I think was made for a basketball court. <laughs> Huge, with big red letters on it. She said, Ted, even you cannot miss this. So I'm going to not miss it. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to flash the question, discussion questions up for, uh, in just a second. Thank you for your attention this morning. I hope I've given you some seed that can help you. Um, and um, I hope you don't have a wake-up call like I had, those of you that are younger than me. Don't let it go that far. So it's a holiday season. There's a lot of money pressures on holiday season. Just come and see my wife. She'll give, be uh, happy to give you some free advice. Ah. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>